Jeremy Branch here from the Weekly Pop Podcast. Super excited to be at Pentacon 2016. Joined with one of the coolest people in the world, John Schnepp. How are you doing, sir? Hey, what's going on, Jeremy? Not a lot. Really happy to be uh, able to hang out with you guys here in Pensacola. Is this your first time here? Yeah, this is my first time in Pensacola. It's a great, a great, is, is it a city or town? Or is it a fusion? It's, it's a city town. We're trying to be a city. Man, this city town is amazing. Uh, when I got off the airport and in a tiny plane, it's like, you know, landed and then literally it's like, welcome to uh, Pensacon. And there's like Darth Vader and Mickey Mouse and... Uh, maybe there's not Mickey Mouse. I'm like channeling a Darth Vader. Yeah, a fusion. <laughs> so Spider Man, a whole bunch of different characters. Every uh, gate of the airport was like Stargate 10 or Stargate 2. I was like, they really go all out here and to welcome everyone to Pentacon. So and I thought it was great. That's not a normal thing. That is not a normal thing when you get off an of airport and you're transformed into the entire the entire town is basically celebrating uh, comic book culture. So that's kind of a cool thing and. And everyone, everyone that I've uh, experienced so far over the last three days has just been really nice and friendly and happy to be here. Very so it's cool. a it's a really good uh, it's a good uh, a feeling uh, when you're around all your brethren. Everyone's having fun, getting into science fiction, fantasy, comic books, collectibles, meeting people who work in the business, and it's just been a lot of fun. Definitely, and this is something that you probably do fairly regularly. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you still get excited to meet celebrities, people that you look up to? You know what? I it's it's less about that. It's more about like just hanging out with everybody, sure. you know, celebrities, uh, fans, comic book writers, artists, people who are selling cool toys. I think it's a whole the whole experience for me. I started going when I was a little kid. You know, New Haven, Connecticut. There was a thing called Creation Conventions, which were all Star Trek based. So I was a science fiction nerd when I was a little kid, like eight, nine. My dad would take me, dro drop me off. Met like Walter Koenig and, you know, James Doohan and stuff like that. So I was like, it was cool. Sulu, he was like, why don't you come jogging with me? He was like, a whole, whole bunch of people go jogging with Sulu. I didn't jog. I was like, yo, I'm not jogging. But anyway, so I, that, I started out pretty young going to conventions. Uh, we'd always go to San Diego Comic-Con. Once I had moved out to uh, L.A., it was like 97 was my first uh, San Diego Comic-Con. And... um just been a big a big uh, supporter of these kinds of uh, big festivals, these conventions where all of all of our interests are kind of fused together, and they all center around the world of comic books and science fiction and fantasy. So for sure, and uh, you you are the director of the Death of Superman Lives. What happened? That's right, this little film right here. Um, I'm a big fan of the movie. You did a screening of it last night. I'd yeah. say it went pretty well. The, did. the audience seemed to respond very well everybody, to it. Everybody was really cool and they dug it and had really good questions about everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the film, uh, I, I, it was just something like I had been directing cartoons for like the last 10 years. I'd made Metalocalypse, Venture Brothers, uh, animated Black Panther, just a bunch of different cartoons. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a break and try to make a documentary just about something that interested me just as an off subject thing. I would just collect. Uh, pictures. There's Dana Snyder just hey, sim simply. Hey, Sarah, stage screen stage. But look at this organic things happening right here. You can't find it anywhere Dana's, else. Dana's right behind me. We're good pals. We did a we did a panel with Jeremy yesterday. That was a lot of fun. Talked a lot about uh, nothing on the panel, but uh, it was very fun. It was very fun, yeah. and I started to realize like I'm ashamed of my broken cell phone. And now I realize that I have no reason to be like twenty percent no, of the audience. That's right. We we had a, a little uh, little you know. <laughs> whenever we do panels, especially me and Dana, we uh, we just change it up a lot, and it's very free form and flowing and totally insane. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So the film I'd been collecting artwork on it was something that interested me. It was a film that never got made. It was supposed to be made in nineteen ninety nine. Nick Cage was going to play Superman. It had that same kind of like people were like, ah, oh, that would have sucked, but. As I looked into it, I think actually the film would have been something really unique and special. And uh, as I interviewed Kevin Smith and Tim Burton, uncovered a lot of uh, never before seen artwork and footage, the whole movie kind of came together. Basically a documentary about the development process of films. So, and how something could seem like it's going right and then it'll go off the rails or just be canceled for a various different reasons. So that's kind of, kind of what the film's about. And, uh, I'm really happy with the response. It's been doing really well. Yeah, it turned out great. And I, I know I don't want to drag you down a lot of the same roads that I'm sure every interviewer asks you, but what is a little bit of the difference between doing a documentary and doing a cartoon? A lot of people ask me, how do you direct a cartoon? And my answer is like exactly like direction film, but spread out over like 42 weeks. Like you have a set, you have costumes, you have actors, you have props, 
you have cameras, you have the crew, you shoot it, but then you have to dissect that and then spread that out where you're like working with the background designer, the character designer, the props designer, the storyboard artist, you go and record all the voices separately in an audio booth, everything separate, then you all edit it together with the editor, take those storyboards, put them on top, that becomes an animatic, that's broken up, broken up to the animators, the background artists, it's just this entire process, but it's very much the same, it's just spread out is how I could explain it. Uh, directing is very managerial in both forms, you have to be on top of every single thing, mm -hmm. continuity, how things work, how are actors working together? How are they reading their lines? Exactly like when you're making a real film or a, t a TV show, only like I said, it's kind of spread out. It all comes together in the end. The difference with both of those products versus documentary is even with animation, even with uh, live action, you have a script. So you have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. You have, a, you have your story arc, and you're, you know how to pace it, and you know how to build it because mm -hmm. it's there. And that's you take you. It's basically the spine of what you make as a director. You're taking the script and making it. Right. I see. A documentary exists only in your mind. Like here's the temporal spine, which will change over every single interview that you do because you don't know what the person's going to say. It's unscripted. You don't know who you're going to get. It's a it's a dice roll. Some people will be like, no, I don't want to be. I don't want to be part of it. Other people are like, oh, I just found this other dude. I didn't even know he was part of it. He, he, was, he did this. That's what happened with this documentary, The Death of Your Man Lives. What happened, it started it in 2013, raised the money myself, crowdfunding it on Kickstarter. Me and Holly Payne produced it. We worked on it for two and a half years. And over that two and a half years, I thought I could do it in seven months. It took a lot longer. I had to do another several crowdfundings and a lot of other, uh, just to be able to finish it properly. But by doing it that way, and doing it myself without, uh, I had total ownership of it. So I was like, I knew like, hey, it's done when I say it's done. So okay. I was able to like mold it to what it is now. Because if, say if a, a studio owned it, they would have been like, it's done. Just finish it and release it like a two years ago. Sure. I would have never gotten Dan Gilroy. I would have never gotten John Peters. The film itself would have been a completely different creature. So and you formed the narrative around all of the stuff that you were able to get yeah. afterwards. Something that I've always kind of uh, respected about you, you got your hands in a lot of different pots, and you still come off as like you're, you're just a regular dude. And yep. I think people really respond about that. Uh, I don't know Wait, if... Here's where I reveal, I am an alien. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. they live, face. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Heroes is a show that you run on Collider. Collider Videos is the right. name of the YouTube channel. Yeah. And you kind of put the notes together for, for all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, you say something that cracks me up and I think that my generation and me in particular are responsible for the current state of the comic book industry right. um, if you could just shame me publicly about buying all of those alt covers oh. and holographic covers you and all what? of those things publicly it's uh, I'm not out to shame anybody it's really it's more about just like the new, the new crop of uh, the new generation so to speak of the last two generations maybe it's a lot different than maybe what comic books were in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I think like mid 90s, 2000s. It's it's changed quite a bit. What I'm trying to say when I when I say, look, I need you to get into these characters, is because you're missing out. I think there's so many amazing stories that are available. Say for any character, you could say Batman or Superman or Spider Man. There's also Characters that you might not have heard of, like Nexus or American Flag, a lot of characters from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So it's like comic books are like literally like this, like kind of like really amazing history that's mm -hmm. just waiting to be explored. I think especially nowadays with with movies being the prevalent form of entertainment as far as what's dragging people to movies and television to these comic cons, which are now kind of culture cons. Mm -hmm. Is that it's? I mean, everyone's interested in the you know stories, especially when you have Netflix dropping like a full season of Daredevil in one day. People are like, "I gotta watch it." It's like it's like, "Oh my god!" You know, yeah. that's it's a really cool thing. But I, I implore people to read Daredevil: Born Again or read any of the Frank Miller Daredevils. You know, I mean, just because if you like the television show, you're gonna love these comic books. And I think that when you get into what the source material is, that's what I'd like to see happen with a you know. I mean, I'm, I'm actually starting a documentary next week on Kickstarter. It's in my new documentary. It's called Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. And it's about exactly that. It's about the, the rise of superhero films and the decline 
in readership of comic books and the closing of comic book stores. And I mean, kind of like what I'm trying to do with this documentary is find out what is the future. I mean, a lot of people keep pointing towards digital comics. I'm not sure that is the future. I was going to ask books. you. I mean, if if that's not viable, where do, where what are we left with? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what we're going to explore in the movie. I mean, I I have my own possible answers, but I feel like that's what I want to I want to ask everyone who's involved in the world of uh, of this media, like writers, directors, artists, producers, heads of companies, comic book owners. So I want to kind of like almost make a you know a little town meeting via this documentary and try to figure it out. Um, and so that's kind of my next my next documentary. So do you I'm think glad like you asked that. millennials kind of have a different perception of digital or yeah. something? Well, I mean, honestly, the world we live in right now. I mean, I, I think it started with music getting downloaded, but uh, music, and then it became movies, and then television shows, and now comics and books. I think because if you grow up with a little tablet where you're sort of like you could just get every, anything for free. And the idea of the consequence of like, oh, this person put like four, five, ten years of their life into this, but you're just taking it for free. You're like, oh, they're getting paid by a big company or I don't care if they're getting paid. That's kind of what happens every time you download an, a, a song or download a book or a comic book or a movie, you're stealing from people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just the truth. Whether people like, well, I buy my books, but I steal my music. It's still like people make different, I'll, I'll do it when I get money. It's a constant, like, people are okaying it th with themselves, and that's just how it is. That's our culture now, especially younger people, because they didn't, they didn't grow up with, like, oh, I had to go to this store and buy this and this. They could order everything online. Everything's delivered to them. Mm -hmm. And then everything else, all media, is just kind of expected to be free. In a certain sense, it's kind of this weird expectation of, like, well, you should just give it to me. I, yeah. Or when's it going to be on Netflix? Because that technically is free because I pay seven bucks a month for all this. Mm -hmm. So it is really, it's a changing medium. And when I say medium, I'm talking about all of entertainment, all media. It's constantly changing. So I don't know what the actual answer to that is, but I think it's the most important thing is to let everyone know that everyone should be responsible for each other. I mean, that's what keeps this entire group together. All these Comic-Cons are all running on the function of everyone enjoying what everyone else does That's right. and supporting it and the way you support it is you know hey, if you want to become part of the industry get in there and get involved if you enjoy the industry pay into the industry you know so that's kind of it just has to happen that way otherwise the industry will collapse and unfold on itself and you won't have cool stuff anymore right millennials you want to have cool stuff so absolutely. absolutely i'm talking about everybody i'm not even talking about millennials i'm talking about everybody so tdoslwh.com is where you can rent this film it's available for rental. You can get the entire film digital download. It's got eight and a half hours of extra features. Me and Kevin Smith just sweating out about comic books, tons of behind the scenes stuff on building the suits. And, uh, or you could just buy the actual Blu-ray. You can order it at the website as well. And uh, thanks again for supporting independent film. And I'll see you guys later. Check out Collider Heroes on YouTube. Thank you so much for talking to me, John. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Cheers.